I will um, welcome Dr. Alan Metters to talk about family fortunes and looking at Jacobean merchants in Kings Lynn. <clears throat> Yes, you need to be able to see the pictures because they're the only decent thing in this. Um, I've got five, five sections to this talk, what we might call the academic intellectual context, just based on three quotations. It's a little bit about Lynn's topography, not very much. And then I'm concentrating on three particular case studies, really, the Clark family, Thomas Snelling and his family, and the Atkin family. This is the first of my three quotations. This is the one that got me going on all this back in the early 1970s, which now seems a different world. <clears throat> one important and almost untilled field of urban study is that of the personnel of the governing class in different towns, the potentiores, as they were called at Lynn in the 15th century. Were they oligarchies? And if so, how were they recruited? Was it relatively easy to make the grade in one's own town? Or was it intimidatingly difficult? What kind of people got on in this special sense? And how did they do it? Using oligarchy in its strictly accurate sense of government by a few. People talk about Russian oligarchs these days, which is completely wrong. We just call them plutocratic criminals instead. Um, <laughs> But um, he, he raises the point about oligarchy. And in fact, King's Lynn's government in the 17th century uh, was pretty much oligarchic. There was a mayor, there were 12 aldermen with 18 common councillors. The councillors elected the aldermen, the aldermen elected the councillors, and the councillors elected the mayor from among the aldermen. You could only get into this charm circle by invitation basically, by being well known. Um, the second quotation is going back a bit, back to the 1890s, Mrs. Alex, Alice Green talking about Lynn in the 15th century. In Lynn, it was always the merchants who conquered. One by one, they vanquished their opponents, the church, the mediocres, the inferiores. A singular and pathetic unity pervades the history of the town from first to last. This terminology, potentiores for the powerful ones, the elite, mediocres, the, the freemen, inferiores, everybody else, including all the women. But you'll see before we go to the end of this talk that there are some remarkable women who pop up in this particular story. But that terminology would be dropped <clears throat> by the time we get to the early 17th century. The final quotation is going back to the early 17th century itself. Um, this is Sir Henry Spellman talking about the merchants of Lynn <clears throat> when he wrote this book in, in the 1630s. For other matters, I will only note what I've observed touching them in general. When I was young, they fl flourished extraordinarily with shipping, trading plenty of merchandise, native and foreign, some men of very great worth, as Killing Tree, Grave, Claiborne, Violet, Lendl, he meant Sendel, actually, he got the name slightly wrong. Many of good note, as Grant, Overend, Poe, Baker, Waters, and many more, of a later time. But all of them, with their male posterity, are in effect extinct and gone. And as at this day, they have little shipping or trade otherwise to the Black Indies, as they call it, that is Newcastle for coal. So there is not a man amongst them of any estimation for his wealth or of any note that I can hear of, descended from any that were an, was an alderman there in the beginning of Queen Elizabeth. He sounds a bit sour, not surprising really, because he had approached the Corporation of Lynn, who chose the MPs for the borough, to become one of their MPs. And they basically just told him to shove off because they were going to elect two of their aldermen as their MP. So I think he was a rather embittered individual. But he did say two things there, which are still quite interesting. One was the fact that some of these merchant families didn't seem to last very long. There was no sort of generation after generation after generation staying in, which I'll come back to. And then the second thing was his reference to the Black Indies, to the coal trade. This chart is based on some work I've done on the port books, on the customs accounts of Lynn, 
in the early 17th century. And each of the columns shows the, if you take each month working from left to right, you've got coastal inwards, coastal outwards, overseas inwards, overseas outwards. Um, and you can see the huge predominance of coastal shipments inwards during the port, uh, in, in the port during the year, building up to a sort of mighty climax in about set August, September, when there were a hundred or so ships coming in. And most of those ships were coal ships coming in from Newcastle or Sunderland. Uh, so coal is a crucially important part of Lynn's commercial activity uh, in this period. There were other things going on, of course, as well, but coal was the rather unglamorous uh, basic source on which an awful lot of the wealth from which an awful lot of the wealth was derived. This is a modern picture taken on a perishing cold February morning from the other side of the river of the Lynn waterfront with the um, twin towers here of St. Margaret's Church, the Lynn Minster, the uh, Hanseatic warehouse complex down there, and a 16th century warehouse here, the tower of Clifton House at this point, and then a bit further along the spire of St. Nicholas Chapel. Not wholly different from this presentation. This is a picture that was drawn, that was painted by Henry Bell, one of the Lynn worthies of the later 17th century, of the same waterfront scene <clears throat> taken from the other side of the river, although quite where he was standing when he did it, I'm not quite sure because there's nothing that, that's that, that high on the other side of the river unless he was suspended from some kind of balloon. But uh, it shows the same sort of thing. Uh, we've got, again, the Minster, St Margaret's Church here, this time sporting a rather impressive spire on the South Tower and also a central tower. And then we've got St Nicholas Chapel down at the end. Um, and most of the waterfront properties are very, very similar, although a good many, of course, have been changed in recent times. Floating at the top, we've got the 17th century equivalent of a Chinese weather balloon or spy balloon, uh, a couple of angels supporting the town shield, town crest. The angel on the left is wielding the mayoral sword. The one on the right seems to be holding the King John Cup, one of the treasures of Lynn currently still has. That was what St Margaret's, the Lynn Minster, used to look like when it had this rather splendid spire on the South Tower and also the Ely Cathedral-like central lantern tower. Both of those were lost in the 18th century. There was a huge gale in 1763 which brought them crashing down and they practically destroyed the nave which then had to be rebuilt. I'll come back to Lynn Minster a bit later on. Henry Bell also did this drawing, this, this ground plat or plan of the basic topography of Lynn. Again, later, late, this is late 17th century. It, it dates from a period after the Civil War. So one should ignore all the Civil War defences around the perimeter because they weren't there in the Jacobean period. But the basic layout of the town was just much the same. The original settlement was here between the Perth Fleet and the Mill Fleet uh, around St Margaret's Church and the Saturday Market. To the north, you had the so-called new land laid out by Bishop Turb in the 12th century around the, uh, the Tuesday Marketplace. <clears throat> Everything clustered around the waterfront apart from this bit of ribbon development here, which then was called Damgate and is today called Norfolk Street. And then we've got the, th the third component, which was South Lynn down here, rather more sparsely populated, uh, and formerly not part of the borough of Kings Lynn until the reign of Mary I in the mid 16th century. It seems amazing that when that remarkable South Gate was built, which is still there, uh, South Lynn wasn't actually in, uh, a part of the corporation's jurisdiction. If we zoom in a bit on the north end of the town, um, this is how Bell <coughs> represented the St. Nicholas Chapel. And it's a pretty fair representation, in fact, because today it looks like that, <coughs> which is 
physically much the same. An absolutely wonderful building. You go inside, and it's one of those buildings that sort of takes your breath away, really. I think it's absolutely magnificent, wonderfully proportioned, and everything else. Uh, eat your heart out, St. Peter Mancroft, is what I say. Um, it's a terrific building, but interestingly, it was never a parish church. It was a chapel of ease to St. Margaret, which was always the major parish, the, well, the only formal parish in the borough. If you walk down the central aisle of St. Nicholas Chapel and look a bit to the left, you'll see a tomb monument, uh, a memorial uh, monument rather there, which I'll come back to. This is a Thomas Snelling. To the right, there's another one, this one, with the Clark family. And that's the one that I'm going to start with because this is a much better picture of it taken by a good friend of mine called Philip Marich. This is the monument to the Clark family, erected by Matthew Clark, the son, and he's the one on the right, as you look at it, kneeling there in his aldermanic robes with his second wife and their four sons clustered around them. Underneath is his deceased first wife, looking a bit dusty uh, when I took that photograph, and apparently lacking feet. Uh, to the left, the two figures on the left are his father and his mother. His father was Alderman Richard Clark um, and his first wife. Matthew erected that to them all and he, he inscribed it with this very fulsome um, family history, basically, um, about, uh, which, which I'll try and uh, read to you. I can't really see it terribly well on this screen. But uh, here lieth the aged Richard Clark, um, who served late Queen Eliza. Nice bit of familiarity. Uh, Thirty years as searcher and collector in the in this port, and who besides, as in record appears, was sometime alderman, justice of the peace, and mayor here. His travels all did cease. There's some rather sort of dodgy poetry gets pulled into this uh, old thing. But it's worth noting that he came in, he, he, he came to the town as a customs officer, a searcher and collector in the port. Uh, searcher was one of the three principal customs officers um, who was uh, appointed by the crown. The other two were the customer and the controller. Um, Collector meant he was a collector of the new impositions, one of the temporary taxes that got introduced from time to time. But note that, that he came in as a customs officer. He was quickly brought onto the corporation. The Lynn Corporation was always very keen to make sure that customs men were on their side. So they invariably tried to incorporate them into the, into the ruling body so that, you know, they keep an eye on them and, you know, make sure they can get out of hand. Um, his first wife, Joan, he says, to Thomas Parker, born of Norwich, where her vital thread made breach. Um, he doesn't say anything. Matthew doesn't say anything about Richard's second wife. The implication is there was a second wife, but she has no mention anywhere. So perhaps they didn't get on or something. So he commemorates his own mother, but not his, mother, his stepmother. Um, Matthew, their son, uh, but now her days are worn married Sarah, daughter to Richard Leach. Uh, sorry, uh, yes. Her mother matched with Thomas Boston, who was likewise mayor and from like friends did flow. So it's interesting, again, he, he mentions, he doesn't mention his stepmother, but he mentions his mother-in-law. Uh, so there was some sort of interesting family dynamics going on there. This Matthew Clark by Sarah, children had twice three and one, two sons and daughters, five. So it's all adds up to seven. Um, two daughters are with earth's mantle clad, the rest God have the praise, yet do yet survive. Thus here below, old, young, and is it, can I read it? Oh, old, old, young and mean <clears throat> do, do die, look, Thou above there, there's eternity. Um, 
<clears throat> so we've got all this sort of family history. And then the, the, the things that are written either side of that inscription um, fill it all out. On the top left, you've got Richard Clark, uh, and gives it you know, his date of, of, of death, um, albeit 4th of February. Um, on the other side, if you read across to the other side, it's got the year and his age. And so you can have the, you have the same, the same uh, kind of information going down for his wife, Richard's wife, Joanna, who died in December. On the other side, gives her a date and her year and, and age. <clears throat> then Sarah, the wife of Matthew, on the other side, her date of death and her age. Joanna, the wife of Thomas Boston, his mother-in-law, who gets this book in for reasons that are not altogether clear. And then below that, we've got the two daughters who died. Sarah, here, Philia Matt Clark, albeit June the 29th, died. And then on the other side, gives the date of her death. I think it's 1599, isn't it? But no age is given. And then underneath that, another daughter called Sarah, who died on December the 15th. And on the other side, they've completely missed out the year uh, and her age. It's very remarkable that that information was left out, that the thing was left incomplete. And knowing the sort of a man Matthew Clark was, because he clearly took no prisoners with anybody. He was a pretty hard-hitting alderman and examiner of accounts and one thing and another. <clears throat> and yet he let them get, he let whoever did that uh, 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 memorial uh, get away with leaving it incomplete. But uh, if you pull out a little bit further, you've got filled in the further details about him, Matthew Clark himself, when he died, that was put up presumably by his wife. Um, and here we have, here lieth Matthew Clark, Master of Arts of Christ's College in the famous University of Cambridge. Now there's an interesting twist, he's a graduate. Twice Burgess of the Parliament House, twice Mayor of this town, a learned and religious magistrate, um, whose gain in heaven is our loss in earth. And then on the other side, uh, you've got the information about his second wife, uh, who was the widow of a man from Bury St Edmunds, a clergyman from Bury St Edmunds. Um, and from her, there were four further sons. So quite a big family. I mean, he died 1623 uh, at the age of 59. So he packed it in. We can fill out more details about the family from using other sources, using parish registers and uh, wills and uh, information about the um, <clears throat> elections to the corporation and all that sort of thing. These are the baptisms of the Clark children recorded in St. Margaret's parish register. That St. Nicholas did have a separate baptism register until after 1628. Eldest uh, daughter, Joanna, baptized February 15, January rather, 1590. Sarah, the little girl, baptized 1594, died 1599, age five, obviously then. Margaret, another daughter who stayed in the town and she married Thomas Stelling, who I'm gonna come on and talk about in just a minute. Married him at about the age of 18, therefore. Another daughter, Elizabeth, uh, baptized 1598. And then finally they get a son. Uh, who they call Matthew, inevitably. Um, and then another son called Richard, after his grandfather. Uh, and he was described in 1623 when Matthew made his will as still being at learning. Uh, and in fact, both of those sons, Matthew and Richard, followed their father to Christ College, Cambridge, uh, and both graduated from there. And then finally, we've got little Sarah, the final daughter, baptized. June 1604, died, uh, sorry, bare, buried in December 1604, so just lived a few months. And then finally, we get the, 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 the bad news about uh, Matthew's first wife, who clearly died in childbirth, as a result of childbirth. Uh, Sarah's mother had been buried there two days before the little girl was baptized. So um, that was his family. At the bottom, we've got the four sons from the second marriage, John, Joseph, Robert, Jones. And interestingly, none of these sons seem to stay in Lynn. 
they just disappear. They, they, they've got, uh, we could probably chase them, I haven't had the time to do it, but they didn't stay in Lynn. They didn't follow their father into the borough government. So the clerks were just, as far as the governorship, the, 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 the political leadership of Lynn was concerned, it was a two generation affair. There was a father, Richard, there was Matthew, and then that's it, they're gone. So in that sense, the pattern that Henry Spellman described pretty much stayed intact. Moving on, <clears throat> this is the tomb of, the, the, the memorial, sorry, to Thomas Snelling and his wife, Margaret, showing them both earnestly in prayer. Margaret was the daughter of Matthew Clark. <clears throat> and, and of course, this monument, sort of, it's, it's almost a twin. It, it, it's a match to the, to the other one. They're both sides of the, um, uh, of the uh, in the transepts of St. Nicholas Chapel. And it shows their four children underneath, uh, three boys and then the baby girl. <clears throat> he shows his coat of arms between, between the two of them, slightly above that, the arms of the city of London, interestingly. And then above that, you've got death. The um, inscription underneath is, again, remarkably full and also followed by some fairly excruciating verse. Um, Here lieth Thomas Snelling, son of John Snelling, twice mayor of Thetford, who married with Margaret, daughter of the near-lying Matthew Clark, twice mayor of Lynn, by which Margaret he had three sons and a daughter. He was sometimes a worthy merchant and citizen of London, who afterwards removed to this place, where he was chosen alderman in his course, the mayor of the town. He died in the year of his mayoralty, being the 39th year of his age, April the 20th, Anno Domini 1623. But he died at the age of about 38, in other words, it is his 39th year, which is remarkably young, really. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a table in a minute, which shows a, a range of ages by which people could sort of get themselves involved in the Lynn elite. And then we've got the excruciating verse underneath. Pity, justice, bounty, good to all. These were his characters most principal. His pity helped the poor, ill doers his justice had. His friends, his bounty, his goodness, good and bad. Thus Lynn hath lost by his departure hence the wicked's terror and the poor's defence. Makes you wonder how he'd be voting if he was alive today, doesn't it? Um, but that's not lost which shall be found in bliss, neither is that lost which here entombed is. Sorry about that. Um, but wait a while, and then the trump shall sound, and the dead come forth out of the ground. Good Puritan stuff uh, at, the, at the end. Uh, now, <clears throat> 1623 was not a very good year then for Margaret Snelling. 21st of April, her husband died. 1st of May, her father died. She was now a widow, aged about 28, with four children to support. But she married uh, in 1625 Ambrose Blagg of the Little Horringer Hall in Suffolk. And party, the, the family migrated there. One of the sons, called Matthew Snelling, named after his grandfather, uh, became a miniature painter and courtier in post-restoration London. But again, it's a family which was lost to Lynn, uh, which never took root. He came in, Thetford via London, settled in Lynn, set up in business, died young, and the family just went. We've got more about this. This is, this is talking about the ages of these various different rulers. And I've got the Atkin I'll come back to in a minute, but we've got the two clerks, Matthew and Richard, and then lower down, Thomas Snelling. Um, at the bottom, you can see the, uh, uh, along here, we've got the average ages at which people became, um, first of all, became, oh, you can't really see the top, can you? Uh, the, the first column is the age at which they became freemen, that's the first step on the ladder to becoming established businessmen, uh, became, on the whole, in their late 20s. People who became freemen by birth, by being the eldest son of a freeman, were often younger, and 
people who became free by apprenticeship were often a bit younger. But people who became freemen by purchase came in as established businessmen, bought their freedom, they could be much older. So on the whole, people came in in their late 20s. In the late 30s, they might be elected to the Common Council. In their 40s, possibly get on late 40s, become an alderman. And in their 50s, if they were lucky, might get elected mayor. Um, this is a considerably younger sort of public profile than what you find in Norwich, for example, where in Norwich, aldermen and mayors were invariably people in their 60s or 70s. I mean, Norwich was run by a bit of a gerontocracy, really. In Lynn, they had much more youthful, younger people knocking about. Uh, Snelling, you can see, uh, became a freeman at 26, came in in 1611, elected to the Common Council in, as, at the age of 30, alderman at 32, mayor at 37, died at 38, which was not part of the plan. Above, up above, you've got the Clarks. Richard Clark, the father, came in at 44 as a freeman because, as I say, he came in as the searcher of the port, as a, as a customs official, so he's a bit older. Uh, elected to the Common Council pretty much straight away, elected alderman pretty quickly too, and elected mayor the year after, which was again was a story of incredibly rapid promotion. Somebody who was clearly seen as important to keep on side. He did serve as mayor only the once, interestingly, in, uh, and before he died. And then Matthew, again, quite a young Turk in certain respects, a freeman at 25, common councilman at 30, uh, alderman at 39, and mayor at 41. He served twice as mayor. Um, so the, 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 this gives you an idea of, of the sort of people we can, we, can, we can work all these things out. As long as you've got a, the age of somebody at death, you can only do it by working backwards when you know how old they were when they died. This is Thomas Snelling, looking rather magnificent in his mayoral gear. Um, and it shows in the top right-hand corner his merchant mark. And what's interesting is that when Snelling first appears in the customs accounts in 1612, uh, they put his merchant mark in there, here. The same, basically the same one. You can just about make out a T and an S in the middle of all that, if you look carefully. Um, I don't know, how is your secretary hand? Is that, uh, you know, can you, can you manage this sort of thing or not? I'll, I'll give you a start. Uh, at the top, uh, it says, in the Margaret of Lynn, 70 ton, Richard Gittings, master to Elbing in the East Country. The East Country is all one word. I mean, that is the Baltic. Um, Thomas, in, Thomas Snelling, in the indigenous merchant, 8,000 grey coney skins seasoned and 7,000 stage, that is unseasoned. Um, and it go, I go through the whole thing. Nearly all of this cargo and his subsequent export cargoes, the, these are things that he was exporting, are nearly all skins of various sorts, rabbit skins, coney skins, some sheep skins. So it's no surprise to learn when he became a citizen of London, he was a member of the Skinner's Company of London. And if you think about where your family originally came from, Thetford, he clearly had access to all the Breckland bunny farms to get his skins. So it all starts to fit together. This is something else that's associated with Snelling. This is the tower, the magnificent tower of Clifton House. That's another picture of it, clearly Elizabethan Jacobean in design, attached to what is now what now looks like a Georgian house, but the, the core of Clifton House is in fact a medieval property. <clears throat> the tower was built in, started in the Elizabethan period uh, by a man called George Walden. Uh, if you can read all that, I can't read it on the screen at the moment, but it started in the 1570s and then was left unfinished, um, but it was finished in the early 17th century and Snelling seems to have acquired it in about 1615, soon after he came into the town as a merchant and established himself, married, well into an established Loom family, the Clarks, and set, began to set up his business. Um, he was responsible for finishing some of the decoration. And in fact, if you go to the room that's 
that's mentioned there um, is, uh, is this one with, with, with these uh, elaborate wall decorations, uh, which are still part of the original uh, setup from the early 17th century. That's been set out rather tastefully, I think, by the current owner of Clifton House, Simon Thurley, who used to be the chief executive of English Heritage. And he's done that really rather nicely. He's done it rather well, I think. It, it, it has a sort of a 17th century feel about it, uh, that, that table. We'll move on, finally, to the Atkin family. And I don't know whether you know, Lynn, but this house is nowadays known as Greenland Fishery House. But it was built by John Atkin, a merchant and a brewer. He was, we know he was a big brewer from all sorts of other documentation, which I can explain later on if you've got questions about it. Um, there's the scar of uh, the, 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 the uh, roof scar of a, a building that used to stand next to it, which might well have been uh, a brew house or something of that sort. But this was built in 1605 by Atkin, and it's in South Lynn, not the, any part of the original settlement or the new land, not, not, not the, the pucker bits of town where the upper cross people tended to live. He, he came into the town in the 1580s, migrated there from Wells, uh, where he was born and brought up. And presumably he bought this property in South Lynn. I suppose land prices were a bit cheaper down there. But he established his new house, which has been extensively analysed and examined by Vanessa Parker in her very good book called The Making of King's Lynn. Uh, and she's done a thorough analysis of the whole thing. They weren't over keen on right angles um, when they built that one, but um, it's been extensively examined. Uh, on the, 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 this, this is the uh, first floor. And along here was a, a rather magnificent hall on the first floor. This is the ground floor um, arrangement. And this is the looking at the profile from the street. The, the main entrance is through that entranceway there. But there is also a separate door here. And Vanessa Parker pointed out that this room um, with its separate entrance is a room that gives no access to the upper floors. And she put the floor, she, she uh, expressed the opinion that it was possibly a shop, which it might well have been. But I wonder whether it was basically a sort of public bar because the brewer, the, 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 the app kids were big brewers um, and um, they, um, well, I, I thought, I'm sorry, I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, but, 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 but um, it, it, it seems to me that it's more than likely that the building which later became famed as the place uh, through its association with Greenland fishery whalers, the, the people who, it's called Greenland fishery because in the 18th century, people engaged in the whaling industry in Northern waters used it as a tavern, as an inn. Um, and so I wonder whether at least part of it had been a tavern and been a bit of a, something like a public bar at an earlier stage. Again, we go back to that picture, that, that's a table again, John Atkins shown at the top, coming into the town as a freeman in 15, took up his freedom by purchase at the age of 36, became common councilman at 47, so it took him a while to get established compared to some, but clearly did become established as a businessman. Then was elected alderman in, 19, in, in 1607 at the age of 58 and elected mayor at the same time. Now, this was something that was absolutely unusual, unique. It never happened at any other time in the 16th or 17th centuries. And I can confirm that because I've checked in all the whole books. It was a unique occurrence where a man was elected, common, he was elected alderman and mayor by the common council on the same day. And you get the impression he was brought in to sort something out. And I think he was brought in to sort something out. And you can ask me about that later if you like. This is St. Margaret's Church, the Minster, as it now is, <clears throat> with its cathedral-like proportions, magnificent building, 
The nave is an 18th century rebuild. Unfortunately, the, eight, the original 18th century furnishings were all ripped out by the Victorians with an excess of zeal to make it look more medieval, which I think is a great shame because I think it would have been more interesting if you'd have kept an 18th century interior. But if you go down that central aisle past the nave altar into the choir area and look down to your right, you'll see that, which doesn't tell you very much. So you've got to move a few things out of the way, which I very cheekily did. And there you've got the tomb inscription for John Atkin. Eek, Jacket, Corpus, Johannes Atkin. With his merchant mark here, which you can clearly, you know, you can make, you can make out a J-A from that. Around the perimeter of this rather large slab, it enumerates his entire family. It says who they all were. And we can fill it all out with information from parish registers and other things as well. So here we have them. It says, you know, here's John Atkin, alderman and twice mayor, died September 1617, buried two days later. His wife, Joanna, is commemorated, but she lasted another 20 years. Um, and we know that she kept his brewing business going um, in her own name, which was allowed. Widows of Freeman could keep their husband's business going if they chose to, and she did. She seems to have been a remarkable woman in all sorts of ways. Their four sons, William, the eldest, uh, who uh, was born and baptized in Wells, became an alderman and mayor, and he and his father sat together on the aldermanic bench for about 18 months before John died. Uh, he, the tragedy of his life was that he, when he did die in 1623, he had no surviving issue. The marriage with Amy Burham uh, was not hugely successful. There seems to have only been one child born, Joan, who was baptized but didn't seem to live very long. In reading John Atkins' will, sorry, William Atkins' will, which I once did with the class, there's a rather mysterious reference to a mistress, somebody or other, who gets quite a hefty bequest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the people I was talking to were convinced that he had a mistress. I don't know. Um, but William, the eldest son, Thomas, the second son, was eventually to move to Norwich and then on to London and eventually became a uh, uh, was knighted by Oliver Cromwell and became a bit of a national figure. He survived the restoration of the monarchy because he hadn't done anything terribly, uh, not, he, did, he didn't involve in the signing of the King's death warrant or anything of that sort, so he wasn't persecuted. And he seemed to retire to Northamptonshire, I think, uh, lived his time out pretty quietly. There was another John who may have been a, a brewer, um, or he, well, he was a brewer, we know he was a brewer when he died, but um, whether he was the same family, I'm not altogether sure that, confusingly, there, would, there seems to have been another family called Atkin in Lynn around about this time. So he, he although I think it's perhaps more than coincidence if, if, if you had another brewing family called uh, Atkin as well. So I think probably he was the same family. And then finally, we have a Seth, um, who was eventually became an alderman and married the daughter of the then mayor. And then we have the five daughters, who again in include some pretty notable women. The eldest daughter, Anne, like William, born and baptised in Wells, the second, she was the second child. Um, she married Gervais Wharton, who was another member of the corporation. They were the parents of William Wharton, who became uh, the first mayor after the restoration of the monarchy. Clemens, we don't know much about, she probably died unmarried because when she died, she was just buried. She specified as the daughter of the late mayor, so no reference to her husband. Joanna, who married Thomas Slaney, who later became mayor. Fry's Wide, or Fred Witha, who uh, married out of the town by the look. There were plenty of references in William's will to these other relatives, but she didn't have anything much to do with Lynn. And Marjorie, who was later to marry John Percival, who became mayor and was Lynn's representative in the Long Parliament. And she died during her husband's term as mayor. Just to look at something about the merchants, uh, the, the Atkins and some of their commercial activities, uh, there's, a, there's a heading for that, which you can't see, I'm afraid. It says, 
movements of the John of Lynn. This is a ship called the John of Lynn in 1608 and 1609, which you can put together from the port books. You can sort of chart where things were going. And this is a ship that almost certainly belonged to John Atkin. Um, and it was used by John Atkin and William Atkin. Uh, to start off with, you've got a journey, a uh, voyage to and from Dort, Dort or Dordrecht, I suppose it ought to be called these days. It was always referred to as Dort in those records. Then it was going to Scotland, to Leith, and coming back from Colos, or Curras, as they tended to, uh, another important port on the Firth of Forth. And then got involved, it was clearly involved in the coal trade, ships from Sunderland up to Newcastle and back, then two more coming in from Sunderland. Of course, if you remember that diagram I showed you of the um, movements of ships, which showed these huge number of ships coming in, far more coming in than ever went out, apparently, for customs purposes. But all these coal ships invariably left Lynn in ballast rather than taking cargo. They couldn't go out empty. I mean, you can't go to sea in an empty ship. It'll just keel over in a strong wind. So they had to be filled with ballast to go up north unload all the ballast, then load them up with coal, then come back. And in fact, where in Sunderland, if you look at the records for Sunderland and Newcastle, there was a huge issue about the management of ballast and, you know, people, where, where people were putting it, you know, they had to be legitimate ballast shores where people could unload their ballast rather than just fly tipping in effect. Although one suspects there was quite a bit of this maritime fly tipping going on as well. But, um, that ship was engaged in the coal trade. You notice that for, the, for all those shipments from Newcastle and Sunderland, uh, registered the cargoes registered the name of John Taylor, not John Atkin. He's the shipmaster. And another peculiarity of port books is that all these coastal coal shipments are always registered for the customs purposes. I mean, it's free. Sorry, it's free, but they've got to register them. They're always registered in the name of the shipmaster not the actual merchant owner. You go into the following year and a, a few more voyages involving William Atkin using this ship. And then down on the bottom, you've got a couple where William Atkin sent a ship, uh, a, a, a cargo up to Leith, and then it came back from Leith from Colossus with a cargo for John Atkin. The export to Lynn, the exports from Lynn up to Scotland invariably comprised huge quantities of beer. Uh, I don't know whether the Scots were incapable of brewing their own beer or not, but they were importing huge quantities of beer from King's Lynn. What they were sending back was mainly salt and cloth, rather than rough cloth called ticking, which was used to make uh, bed mattresses and things of that sort. Um, so, so we can do all that from the, the customs accounts. Going back to that um, tomb inscription, um, what's your Latin like? Any good? There is this fulsome tribute to John Atkin. Here's a translation, which was done not, I, I can't claim any credit for this. It was done by Paul and Elizabeth Butledge. If it's fitting to weep over the corpse of a man distinguished by piety, then Atkin, who's died, is to be mourned. Alas, he who has died is to be mourned on our account, not his. He's not. The highest stars hold him while we are bereft on earth. He twice discharged the office of mayor of the borough, Lynn. Happy he went to meet and draw near to God. The Republic of Lynn, weeping, forbids the speaking of more things, for it causes regret to view afresh his loss. The use of that phrase, Republic of Lynn, is quite interesting. Uh, there's nothing anti-monarchical about that. I think they're using the word republic in the sense of commonwealth or community of Lynn. Um, but certainly not, I mean, the, the irony is, of course, when the Civil War broke out in 1642, Lynn was the only place in the East that declared for the king, which wasn't a very sensible thing to do in a strongly parliamentary army area. They, they found themselves landed with a, a huge military garrison, which they then had to pay for, for the duration of the rest of the war. This is a portrait of William Atkin. This is the oldest civic portrait in the Cannon Ball at Lynn. Um, and it shows him looking rather resplendent in his mayoral gear again. 
his coat of arms in the top right hand corner and his merchant mark top left and you can make a doubt I think from that WA pretty clearly whether he looked like his father or his mother we really don't know but again um, this was not a family which lasted very far into the 17th century uh, by the time you get to the late 17th century uh, the Atkins have gone and in fact the Wartons who carried on for a bit uh, also disappeared and that's it so <clears throat> Um, Alan has very yeah. kindly said that agreed to take any questions. Is there anything either online or in the audience? Um, one online. Okay, we'll go on yeah. online and then. Um, Please ask, uh, we'd like to know what John Atkins brought and sought out. I thought everybody should somebody ask about that. Okay. Yeah, uh, this was this was this was Lynn's great scandal. Uh, it involved another alderman. Man called Thomas Baker, who was a basically a paedophile and pedophast. He was a homosexual, but he was a predatory homosexual. Um, at a time when, in point of fact, buggery was a capital offence since 1533, when Henry VIII passed the Buggery Act, you, you know, you could be killed, you could be executed for that. And he had clearly been putting himself about with. A number of people, young men on the corporation, young men went to him to, when he was mayor to solicit his assistance to become freemen, and the price they had to pay was not quite what they were expecting. Now we know all about this because, say, I think Atkin was brought in to sort this out, and during his mayoral year, he did actually secure the expulsion of Thomas Baker from the corporation, and the, the whole books talk about his vile notorious behavior they kicked him out it wasn't the end of the story because baker was skilled in the law and he went to the court he went to king's bench and secured what were called writs of restitution he made a case to say that they had a bit like donald trump you know claiming electoral fraud they claimed that it, it, it you know they had no good reason to throw him out because they never specified specifically what it was they just talked about evil behavior and he managed to work his way back in to uh, the corporation he had to be restored and he stayed on the corporation till, till he died but the common council never really elected him as mayor what was then interesting was that he then after mayor's after Atkins mayoral term was ended brought a case in star chamber against Atkin for misbehavior, fraudulent dealing, selling beer at excessive prices and all sorts of misconduct in office. This was in the court of Star Chamber. The Atkin defense was a character of assassination, which brought up all this sexual adventurism and misbehavior. And the interesting thing is that because this happened in a civil court, court of Star Chamber, it was nothing to do with criminal courts and therefore, the terms of the Buggery Act were never going to come into it. It was the, 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 the laws were worked in separate channels, you know, and there was no cross referencing. And when I remember when I first came across this in the public record office, I called up this, these Star Chamber cases. There was this one, Baker versus Atkin, about selling beer and one thing and another. This enormous great wadge of papers turned up it's one of these things where your heart both leaps and sinks at the same time because you think oh blimey and then you think oh my god i've got to read all this and the character of assassination was incredible they brought in document witness after witness after witness saying this is what he did to me 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 all catalog which just amplified what this misconduct had been so that i think was why Atkin was brought in as a relative outsider, you know, from Wells. And uh, at the time, the, the corporation was in a bit of a mess. There'd been a lot of resignations at the time. People had sort of decided they had enough. They just walked away from it. So I think that's what it was about. And Atkin was brought in to sort it out. And he did, up to a point. But Baker, say, wormed his way back in. And he just sat around as a miserable old sod uh, until eventually he died. Um, 
So that's the, that's the story. 